Well, hello, and thank you for joining us. Um, today begins our, <clears throat> um, our first time, our first day um, in our Calvary Baptist Church Bible Institute. And um, we've been looking forward to doing this. And this is something that um, I'm presenting to anyone who wants to have a free Bible college course you can take online. Um, a lot of a lot of excellent um, subjects and courses we're going to be studying, uh, probably for quite some time. Um, each week, each week we're going to have uh, two. Um, we're going to have two courses presented, and I'll be discussing what those are in just a moment here. Um, but um, a few years back, actually, I was <laughs> looking back through my records um, back in 2013 to 2015. Uh, we established here at Calvary Baptist Church what we called the Northwest Ohio Evening School of the Bible. And we ran this on Monday evenings consecutively um, for about two years. And there were um, 12 courses um, that, that we studied. And everybody had their textbooks and course books and, and all of that. And I know it was thoroughly enjoyed. And I'm going to be reintroducing that material again, and but also going to be adding to it. So uh, over the course of time, we're going to be studying Bible doctrine. We're going to have a uh, survey of the New and Old Testament, uh, study on the Christian home, um, various book studies. Uh, right now I'm planning to have a study in 1 Corinthians, the book of Hebrews, 1 John, uh, possibly the book of Revelation. Um, there will be studies um, on the end times. There will be studies on um, just various uh, important people in the Bible, the life of David, the life of Abraham. Um, and um, so there's, there's a lot of good material um, that we're going to be looking into. And, um, you know, again, this is free of charge. And um, each week there's going to be uh, at least two lessons that are uploaded uh, or downloaded, whatever, um, on our Calvary Baptist Church Facebook page and on our web page. And so you can take advantage of it. Um, I have the course materials for you to have. I will get that to you um, as well. So thank you for joining us. And we're going to begin our institute with um, the first of two courses. The first is <clears throat> uh, basic Bible doctrine. You can see that here. Again, I will be getting this information to you. And the other one is the overview of the New Testament. So those are the first two courses that we're offering here. Basic Bible Doctrine 1, and then an overview of the New Testament. When we complete Basic Bible Doctrine 1, uh, we will, of course, go into Basic Bible Doctrine 2. Uh, when we complete the overview of the New Testament, we will go into an overview of the Old Testament as well. So I thank you that you can uh, be a part of this. And... Um, we praise the Lord that we're able to do this. So we want to get started right in this, <clears throat> in our Bible doctrine course, our, Babel, our basic Bible doctrine course. And um, you're going to notice how this is broken down um, in weeks 1 through 12. Right? So we have weeks 1 through 12 here. And um, you will notice that in um, weeks 1 and 2, it's bibliology and including week 3. And then theology in weeks four and five, Christology, which is the study of Christ in weeks seven and eight, pneumatology versus, uh, excuse me, weeks nine and 10, which is the study of God, the Holy Spirit, and then angelology um, in weeks versus uh, weeks 11 and 12. And uh, <clears throat> angelology is something that we studied in depth on our Wednesday night Bible Institute about a year or so ago. Um, i like for you to notice, if you would turn the page um, a little bit here, some key scriptures. And we're going to get started right in this with bibliology. Some key scriptures, if you, if you see that there in your notes, key scriptures concerning bibliology. And I'll just read one or two of them for sake of time. But Psalm 12, verses 6 and, and 7 say this, The words of the Lord are pure words. 
as silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. And so this speaks how God has preserved his very word here. Isaiah 40 and verse 8 says, The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. And you can see some of the other references. Um, 2 Timothy 3 verse 16 and 17 uh, shows us about the inspiration of all of Scripture. It says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, meaning God breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man, may, man of God may be perfect. And the, the Bible word is throughly, not thoroughly, but throughly furnished unto all good works. So these are some key scriptures regarding bibliology. So um, have your Bible handy, and let's take a look at lesson number one today. All right, bibliology, bibliology, the doctrine of the scriptures. Bibliology, the doctrine of the scriptures. Now, one thing to bear in mind, and this, this, this bears repeating, that we are speaking about Bible doctrine, Bible doctrine singular, Bible doctrine singular. Bibliology is the study of the Bible. In the word of God, it refers to Bible doctrine singular. And that is because God has given to us a body of doctrine, the Bible. Okay? Within that body of doctrine, there are various teachings. So there's the teaching, for example, what we see today about the Bible. There's the teaching about Christ. There's the teaching about the church and so forth. But it's one body of doctrine that God has given to us. Okay, in that body of doctrine, there are various teachings, but one body of doctrine. Now, uh, when it's referred to um, plurally, doctrines, um, we, we see that in a different light as it refers to doctrines of devils. Um, but we have a body of doctrine, and this is something that will be repeated. Okay, God has given to us doctrine, doctrine. And so as we look at bibliology right here, if we were to divide that word, uh, we, we would see that it means the study of the Bible, right? So you have these words. So you have bibliology, theology, Christology, pneumatology. Okay, if we divide the meaning of those words, you know, kind of put it in half, put a hyphen between them, it would mean the study of that particular subject, Bibliology is the study of the Bible. Pneumatology is the study of the Holy Spirit. Eschatology is the study of end times, and, and so on and so forth. So bibliology is the doctrine, if you see that in your notes, the doctrine of the scriptures. So let's get right into this, and notice that the Bible is a unique book, okay? In Roman numeral number one, some necessary definitions. So you will be able to fill in the blank, okay? You will be able to fill in the blanks here. I'm going to give that to you. So letter A, bibliology, means this. An organized study of the facts about the Bible, which point to its indisputable origin and absolute trustworthiness. Now, that is a great definition, okay? Again, bibliology right? Bibliology. What is it? Bibliology is an organized study of the facts about the Bible. It's an organized study, okay? There's order and structure to it, and that's how God has given it to us. See, God himself is a God of order. Let all things be done decently and in order. So bibliology is an organized study of the facts about the Bible, which point to its indisputable origin. All right, the scriptures are God-breathed and absolute trustworthiness. Thy word is truth. That's what the definition of bibliology is here. Now, the Bible, you follow along, is the foundation of all we believe, and it has to be, okay? As, as Baptists, uh, and we're an independent Baptist church, uh, we believe in biblical authority, 
okay? So we, we have the biblical authority. And um, in other words, the Bible is our authority for faith and practice, okay? And the study of the Bible, the study of the Bible itself, bibliology is foundational, okay? So if you see in your notes, you see that right at the very bottom, the base, the foundation, and this kind of goes up, uh, you know, like in a pyramid form, is bibliology. And that's because all of the other uh, teachings, you know, they rest upon it. Theology, Christology, pneumatology, angelology, anthropology, that's the study of man. Harmartiology, that's the study of sin. Soteriology, the study of salvation. Ecclesiology, the church eschatology, right? The study of end time events, right? They're all on, they're all there, but the, but the study of the Bible itself, bibliology is foundational because the Bible is the foundation of all we believe. So we have some necessary definitions, bibliology, and notice letter B, the word Bible. What is, how, how do we define Bible? Well, it means the finished written word of God which reveals his person, his work, and his will for mankind. So the Bible is the finished written word of God. God is not giving any more revelation, okay? We have a complete canon of scripture. The totality of scripture is in the 66 books of the Bible. And the Bible reveals his person, who he is, his work and his will for mankind. One of the more uh, influential books that um, I've read, I read in seminary, I've read after seminary, is a book by uh, Dr. Dr. Scroggy, okay? Graham Scroggy, and, and uh, the book is entitled The Unfolding Drama of Redemption. It is an amazing book, and um, it shows the person, the work, and the will of God, okay? Unfolding from Genesis all the way through to the book of Revelation. Uh, it's an exciting book as things just unfold. But you see, God's, God's revelation of himself is that. It's, it's God reveals himself throughout the scriptures. Okay? What begins in seed form is ultimately fully developed um, as we come to the end of the New Testament. So the Bible then is the finished written word of God, which reveals his person, his work, and his will for mankind. Now, we have some words here. There's five words. Notice the word finished, okay, in your notes. The scriptures are complete. So that's the fill in, complete. The scriptures are complete. Nothing will be added to them, not from God. Okay, the word written, the word written. This written record can be passed on to every generation. Every generation uh, can have the word of God. God has preserved his word. God has preserved his word. And every generation can, can uh, receive the word of God. The word person, capital P. The Bible is the revelation of who God is. Okay, The word for the fill-in is God. The Bible is the revelation of who God is. And the word work. The Bible tells us what God has done, what he is doing, and what he will do in the future. Such an exciting book. The Revelation, the book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ reveals to us what God will do in the future. And then there's the word his will or will. The Bible shows us what God expects and requires of man. Okay. Now, Underneath that, this, defini this definition explains two truths. Number one, the Bible's origin, meaning that it came from God. And number two, the Bible's content. It reveals God to us. So Roman, number, Roman numeral number one, some necessary definitions here. And now we come to Roman numeral uh, number two. Roman numeral number two. And we have some claims of authority, claims of authority. You notice, please, the scriptures are filled with claims such as the following. And this is important, okay? <clears throat> such as, saith the Lord, thus saith the Lord, the Lord spake, 
and word of the Lord. <clears throat> that last expression, word of the Lord, is used over 390 times in the Bible. So the Bible claims its own authority. Why? Because saith the Lord, thus saith the Lord, the Lord spake, and word of the Lord. So with that in mind, we find some things about it. Notice letter A, the Bible is indestructible. Okay, turn with me to Matthew chapter 24. And uh, note with me verse number 35. Matthew chapter 24 and verse number 35. So the Lord is teaching and he, and he says this. <clears throat> verse number 35. Remember that the Bible is indestructible. Jesus said, heaven and earth shall pass away. But notice, but my words, all the word of God but my words shall not pass away. So even though heaven and earth shall pass away, the Bible is indestructible. Not only that, the Bible is incorruptible. Look with me in 1 Peter chapter number one and notice how uh, the Bible is incorruptible. 1 Peter chapter one <clears throat> and look with me in verses 23 through 25. So the Bible is incorruptible, okay? And it shows us how we're, to, you know, the, it's also the instrument that God uses in the new birth. So verse 23 says, being born again, not of corruptible seed, that's of the flesh, but of incorruptible by the word of God. So the instrument that God uses in the new birth is the Bible, notice, which liveth and abideth forever. Okay. See, that's what eternal life is. Eternal life is forever. Verse 24, for all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. Doesn't stick around too long. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away, but notice, the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word by which the gospel is preached unto you. So, so Peter declares for us that the Bible is in, uh, excuse me, incorruptible. So letter A, you see, it is indestructible. It is incorruptible. Letter C, the Bible is indispensable. Okay, we got to have the word of God. Notice Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 18, our Lord's teaching, okay, our Lord's teaching here, chapter 5 and verse number 18, and uh, notice, notice what he says here. <clears throat> See, verse number 17 says, think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets, I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Now, I just want to point this out because we're going to look at verse number 18. Um, when, you, when you study the Bible for yourself, when you study God's word for yourself, okay, and you're looking at, and we're going to look at verse 18, it, it's always important to read the preceding verse or sometimes verses um, to keep in context the passage that we're going to read. It'll shed light on that particular passage. Okay. So Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill. So he's speaking about the word in verse 18. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. A jot and a tittle, um, like, like the dot on an I and the crossing of the T, even to the minutest detail, all is the word of God and all is indispensable. And then the Bible is inexhaustible as well. Psalm 92 and verse number five. Psalm 92 and verse number, number five. In Psalm 92 and verse number five, we read this. O Lord, how great are thy works and thy thoughts are very deep. So it's inexhaustible. It's inexhaustible. All right. So we see some definitions 
Okay? And then we see claims of authority. Then notice um, Roman numeral number three, and there's a few more fill-ins here. Roman numeral number three here. And uh, let's note some characteristics displayed. Okay? Number one, the first characteristic that's displayed about the Bible is unified doctrine. That is your fill in the blank, doctrine, unified doctrine. An amazing thing when we think about the Word of God. Written by over 40 human penmen over 1,600 years, separated by 1,500 miles, representing all classes of society and all levels of education, yet their message is one. It's remarkable. It's remarkable. And how many of the writers of the Bible came into contact with each other? You know, humanly, personally. Um, Moses didn't come into contact with Matthew, uh, yet, yet, you know, Moses wrote of the Lord Jesus, <laughs> and um, Samuel didn't come into contact with Peter and James and John, and yet there is harmony in the writings, you see. Um, you know, you have various authors, various human penmen. Now again, uh, God himself is the divine author, and the men that he used are the human penmen, and we'll get into the doctrine of inspiration also. Um, but, you know, over the course of 1,600 years, 40 different, 40 different writers from various, you know, having various personalities, backgrounds, different cultures, and so forth. Uh, Matthew was a tax collector. Luke was a doctor. Um, you know, uh, Joshua and and um, Moses and these these were these were men who were who were leaders, and 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 so forth. David was a was a king, um, you know. Uh, it's just amazing who who we see had written the Bible. Amos was a herdman, a farmer, and let's not forget about Job, nor you know Jonah and and so forth, um, and and so over the course of 1600 years and separated by a pretty long distance about 1500 miles they came from various cultures and backgrounds even levels of education yet their message is one okay their message is one again that book that dr scroggy wrote the the unfolding drama of redemption it's the it's the message of of redemption of of mankind so there's a unified doctrine, singular, okay? And again, that's important to bear in mind. Letter B, letter B, here's a second characteristic. Unparalleled declarations. The word is declarations to fill in. Unparalleled declarations. So what does that mean? It means this. The Bible's subject or excuse me, it's subject matter, and you can read this in your notes. It's subject matter is such that only God can know and reveal. For example, what God is like, how the world was created, the origin of sin, the existence of heaven and hell, the way of salvation, future events, and, and, and so forth. So the subject is matter is such that only God can know it, and only God could reveal it. You know, the Bible does not begin in Genesis 1-1 by tr trying to prove the existence of God. It, all, it already declares himself as, as eternal. It all, already declares himself um, in his being. In the beginning, God. And so it doesn't set out to try to prove his existence. It's already an established fact. And what's revealed in the Bible is something only God can know. You know, one of the aspects, uh, I would call it aspects or characteristics, um, or excuse me, the word is attribute. One of the attributes of God is his foreknowledge. Meaning that God knows beforehand what's going to come to pass. Okay? And he knows everything. And the amazing thing about the omniscience of God is that God knows everything. Everything there is to know. 
past, present, and future, and he knows it all at once. There is not one thing, there is not one thing that, that God has to kind of, you know, think it through and uh, try to determine what it means and so forth, okay? He knows it all at once. Oh, what a great statement, Dr. Curtis Hudson, who is in heaven uh, now said this, um, he said one time that, did it ever occur to you that nothing ever occurred to God? Yeah, nothing ever occurs to God. He knows all things. He has foreknowledge of all things. We take, for example, the book of Revelation. And, you know, we, we look at the book of Revelation when, with, with a futurist view in mind. Things that are going to happen in the future. And only God himself can, with 100% accuracy, predict the future. Okay? And, and that's, only, that's only about future events. Um, you know, only God himself, and he's revealed it to us, you know, knows how the world was created. And we believe it to be in six literal days. And the origin of sin and, and, and so forth. And so there is no other book like the Bible because of its unparalleled declarations of itself. So letter B is unparalleled declarations. Letter A is unified doctrine. Letter C, letter C is unwavering development. Unwavering, de there's an unwavering development through the Bible. So truths in the Bible move from a simple uh, from a simple form to a more fully developed form. Um, that means there is a remarkable, progressive unfolding of truth. So, again, God's revelation of himself in the Bible is progressive. Um, oftentimes, it begins in a simple form, something that God is teaching, to where it's fully developed. For example... Okay, in Genesis chapter 3, in Genesis chapter 3, and um, verse number 15, we have the first mention, we have the first mention of the gospel in Genesis chapter 3 and verse number 15. Okay, this is something, and this is a big word. And I wish I could put it on a board, but I don't think you'd be able to see it because of the glare from the light. But some of us, you know, you know already that this is what we call proto-evangelicalism. Proto-evangelicalism, meaning the first mention of the gospel, the first mention of the cross here. And I'll show you what this means. So let's look back at verse number 14. Now remember, we want to read the preceding verse to help us to understand the verse that we're looking at. Verse 14 says, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field, upon thy belly thou shalt go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Okay, That's because uh, you know uh, of sin and what he caused Eve and Adam to do. Verse 16 says, Un, here it is, unto the woman he said, um, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. Uh, uh, excuse me, verse number 15, verse number 15. And I will put enmity, and this is the verse, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It is shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. This is the first mention of the cross in the Bible, okay? The seed of the woman uh, ultimately is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the seed of the woman. And remember that Jesus uh, did not have an earthly father, okay? Um, he was born of a virgin. The Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary. He is the seed of the woman. It shall it shall bruise thy head. Now that speaks, that speaks of the death blow that Jesus would administer to Satan on the cross. He would crush his head, okay? He, he would defeat and destroy the works of the devil, and thou shalt bruise his heel, his sufferings. Now, um, we're looking at this unwavering development. Now, 
the Bible is the book, or excuse me, the book of Genesis is the book of beginnings. And this is the first mention, this is the first mention of the cross and the gospel in the Bible. And it's in, you know, it's in a simple form. The seed of the woman would crush the serpent's head. All right. So it's in a seed form. But think about how, think about how this unfolds and how this progresses through the word of God. So, for example, right, for example, okay, later on in the scriptures, um, we read about um, the uh, instructions in Exodus, in chapters 25 through 40, that, that God gave to Moses concerning the tabernacle, right? Now, the tabernacle, of course, is a, is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a picture of Christ, and that's when you begin to see all of the blood, and you see the high priest, uh, and, and you see, you know, the, the entrance into the presence of God and so forth and everything that, that goes along with it. And I need to even back up a little bit because, um, you know, chapter number six, right, the pronouncement of the flood, um, you have, you know, God told uh, Noah to build an ark. And, you know, the ark itself also is a picture of Christ. So you see what we mean by this. There's only one door and all who entered in, okay, God shut the door and all who enter in were, were delivered from the flood. They were delivered from the wrath. It's a picture of the cross. So, so you see this seed form, the seed of the woman. You see Christ in the ark. You see Christ in the tabernacle and, and in the temple and all the various, uh, you know, uh, animal offerings and the blood and so forth. And then you come, and of course, there's many pronouncements by the prophets concerning the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then you come into the New Testament, and there we see, and there we see in Matthew chapter 1, verse number 1, the first mention of Jesus Christ, the generation of Jesus Christ, right? And then we see through the Gospels, his, his works, we see the cross of Calvary, uh, and we see, you know, through the epistles, uh, further instruction concerning um, Christian living and so forth. And then we, you know, we work our way ultimately to the book of the Revelation, which is the consummation of the age and the return of the Lord Jesus Christ in power and great glory. So there's an unwavering development that we have in the Bible. Truths in God's word move from a simple form to a more fully developed form, and there is a remarkable, progressive unfolding of truth. And that's God's revelation of himself. It is unfolding in the Bible. And then uh, we come to letter D, and this is the uh, fourth characteristic that's displayed in God's word. There is universal design, universal design. Okay, we see this, and you could follow along, please. Man's works are bound by time and culture, but God's word applies to people of all times, of any age, of any culture, of any class, in any geographical location. So in other words, it's, it's meant for all of people, regardless of where they are in life. Uh, their culture, their age, any class of people, where they are in this world, their geographical location. Um, I, I think we ought to be very, very grateful to God that, um, you know, probably every one of us has at the least, at the very least, at least one copy of our King James Bible. And in my study, I have many, I have many copies of, of the Word of God and, uh, and, and God has given to us this blessed book in order for us to know him better, to know who he is, okay? Here is a little poem, and we'll conclude with this. This is the greatest book on earth, unparalleled it stands. Its author God, its truth divine, inspired in every word and line, though writ by human hands. This is the living rock of truth which all assault defies. Or ever stormy blast of time, it towers with majesty sublime. It lives and never dies. This is the volume of the cross. 
its saving truth is sure, its doctrine pure, its history true, its gospel old, yet ever new shall evermore endure. Well, thank you for joining us today in Bible Doctrine. And uh, uh, next time, Lord willing, uh, we're going to continue with part two on Bibliology, the doctrine of the scriptures, the inspiration and preservation of the scriptures.